And so, uh, welcome back to our discussion of uh, Camille Paglia's book, Sexual Personae. We are on chapter two here, which is called The Birth of the Western Eye, um, in which she is going to trace the birth of the Western gaze, what she calls the Apollonian aspect of Western civilization, which she sees having originated amongst the Egyptians. So she'll end the chapter with a discussion of the Egyptian discovery of pure aesthetics in, in the cult of the creation of their great art, statues and so forth, as the birth of the Western gaze. Uh, but she begins with this idea, uh, she starts meditating on cosmogonies and creation myths, and she says that our creation myth in the West uh, has been sanitized. We have inherited creation myths, cos what are called cosmogonies, in the West um, that have been shorn of uh, what William Irwin Thompson used to call wet biology. Okay, uh, wet biology involves the genitals, and involves messy fluids, semen, menstrual blood, all that kind of thing that exists in all the ancient uh, creation myths, especially those of the first generation of civilization, which we might think of uh, what Gebser calls the mythical consciousness structure. Uh, by the time we get to the second generation of civilization with the Hebrews and the Jews, and then of course across the board with, as we talked about last time, the, the Persians and the Hindus and the, and the Chinese, all come in during the second generation and all have a philosophical bent. During that second generation, then uh, those fluids are done away with and we get the, the sort of mental consciousness structure that comes out of all this, that Gebser says. Uh, but you can already see that the myths, before philosophy itself is invented practically simultaneously across the board by all these civilizations around 600 BC, um, you can already see uh, that they're pre-rational, that the sanitizing in the book of Genesis where Yahweh creates everything in a very ordered, rational, systematic way with the power of the voice, genitals aren't involved here at all, wet biology, the lower regions, there's been a shift from belly magic to head magic, as she says, from earth cult to sky cult. Um, and he creates through the power of the word, which I term an appropriation of what I, a term that I have invented called the paternal vulva. And the paternal vulva is the metaphysical vulva, which originally belonged uh, to the cult of the great mother in the uh, age, the pre-metaphysical age, as Slaughterday calls it, which is the first generation of civilization, where it was the maternal vulva and creation took place through the power of the maternal vulva, sometimes through parthenogenetic acts, which means that uh, males need not apply. Parthenogenesis is the creation spontaneously, as we get on the first pages of Hesiod's Theogony, where Gaia spontaneously gives birth to Ornos without insemination by a male. And later in that same text, Hesiod recounts uh, the paternal vulva in response to Zeus's appropriation of the paternal vulva when he gives birth to Athena from his head, um, essentially giving birth to rational thought coming out of the male vulva. Uh, his wife Hera gives birth parthenogenetically to the smith Hephaestus um, in response to that. That's an atavism that's held over from these older mother goddess cults. And Plato at the same time uh, in the Timaeus uh, is also sanitizing and rationalizing cosmology with his myth of the Demiurge who creates using sacred numbers and geometry uh, as the power that brings the world into being. <laughs> where she says her, her favorite creation myth from the age of the wet creation myths that are still in connection with the genitals and the realm of the procreative urges uh, comes from Egypt, uh, which is the myth that she calls Kapera, um, but I think she may have made a mistake. The god is known traditionally as Atum. In the pyramid text, he appears as Atum, which date from 2600 BC and are some of the oldest preserved writings in the world. Uh, he creates, uh, after uh, the goddess Nun, who's just the pure watery abyss, uh, gives birth spontaneously to the first mound, which is the pyramid, and sitting on that, sometimes in some cases represented in a lotus that unfolds its petals, is the god Atum, who emerges like Brahma does out of the lotus in Egyptian myth. And he emerges and he masturbates, and from his semen come the two uh, brother-sister primordial pair, Shu and Tefnut. Shu is the god of, of the atmosphere, and Tefnut is the goddess of rain and moisture. And Shu separates his parents, Jeb, who in this case, in Egypt, unlike in Sumer and in Greece, uh, the earth is male, Jeb is male, and the heavens, the sky goddess Newt, is female. He separates them. Uh, he's the atmosphere that holds up the heavens and separates them. And uh, their, from their copulation has produced um, the, uh, the Ennead, basically, the brother-sister pairs of Isis, Osiris, 
and Zepneftis. So the, this myth is the Heliopolitan Ennead and produces the nine basic protogenetic deities of Egyptian civilization. You can see that it's still in touch with the wet biologies of the genitals that involve creation through either acts of copulation or self-fertilization on the part of the Great Mother. Um, so in the West, we've got these sanitized myths and goddesses need not apply. And she talks about the Great Mother then as this uh, sort of atavism that survived in late antiquity, where uh, it was pretty popular in the cults of late antiquity with the cults of Adonis and Attis and Tammuz and Osiris, all of whom were her dying and reviving weak, passive male lovers castrated in most cases. Osiris's phallus is swallowed by a fish. And the castrati of the cult, the priests of the cult of Sibylle were required to castrate themselves. And as she points out in this chapter, the castration was done using only stone tools. There was a prohibition against metal tools of any kind, which suggests the antiquity of the rite. And she's probably right about this. When there's a prohibition on something like that, it means that the, the original usage of the tool goes way, way back. And castration was part of the cult of the Great Mother. It was part of, there was a lot of, a lot of violence in the cults of the Great Mother that feminists forget about. There a lot of sadomasochistic whipping and initiations and cutting and slicing, genital mutilations and so forth. All of that stuff took place in these cults. And she doesn't think that, uh, she thinks that feminists have it wrong, that there's, they have this fantasy, uh, as with Maria Gambutis, let's say, that there was an age in which uh, men were ruled peacefully by women. Uh, women were these matriarchs. She doesn't believe that there ever was a matriarchy, and neither did Joseph Campbell, by the way. Um, matriarchy rule politically by women is different from matrilineal descent. We know that uh, descent was often traced through the mother, as Bachman points out of the Lycians, uh, and also the Egyptians traced uh, their bloodline through the mother. Uh, that's different. That's matrilineal descent, but it doesn't mean that women are calling the shots and ruling the society, which, again, which uh, Polly rather thinks uh, just didn't happen, because the laws of nature are such that men are designed specifically by nature to protect women and children who are weaker against predators. Predators come in, other tribes come in and try to steal your women, as in the Roman myth of the rape of the Sabines. The men have to be calling the shots. They have to be the ones in control to protect women, especially late phase women in pregnancy uh, who are more and more helpless as they go along and require men to protect them. So she doesn't believe there ever was a matriarchy, and she's probably right about this. Even if the goddess was worshipped and revered as the primary figure, it does not mean that women were calling the shots. Um, but so she traces the Great Mother and she says that the Great Mother then, uh, with the Greeks, began to splinter off and split into a kind of polytheism of all these different weird offshoots uh, that tended to be very, uh, that men were terrified of and that tended to, uh, these are figures like the Gorgon, she says. The Gorgon, it, it is significant turns only men to stone, never women. And Freud's theory for this was that it represents the first freezing fear uh, at the child's sight of a vagina, which looks to the child as though uh, the penis has been chopped off. And so there's a, there's, there's a freezing fear there. And that's what Freud's theory of the Gorgon was. But she says, yes, the Gorgon is the eye. She's tracing the birth of the Western eye here. The Gorgon is the eye that freezes men into stone uh, and turns them into basically statues. And uh, so she looks at some of these other uh, creatures, too, like the Furies, uh, who in Aeschylus' uh, play are featured there. Uh, but the myth of, of their origination is in Hesiod, where he says that they originated from drops of blood that emerged from the castration of Saturn when he castrated his father, Uranus, and the drops of blood hit the ground and upsprang these Thonian Furies. Uh, that have to be overcome, as they are in Aeschylus, whereas Aphrodite was born from the actual genitals of, of Uranus flung into the sea, uh, the foam-born Aphrodite, because she is, after all, the mistress of the genitals, but her birth there is a kind of sanitized version, sh uh, shorn of any Thonian influences. And so then we've got characters like the Sirens, who are a pair of twins in the Odyssey, uh, who are on the islands and they sing songs to men that lead them to their destruction, or uh, the pair Scylla and Charybdis. Scylla is the monster, uh, the kidnapper, the, the monstrosity who grabs sailors off of boats, and Charybdis is the whirling, swirling whirlpool, the sucking abyss uh, that she thinks is possibly a version of the vagina dentata. Um, so there are all these offshoots and characters which the Great Mother splinters into and gives birth to that are overturned and rejected uh, as too Thonian, 
by uh, the Greeks. And then so she goes on in the discussion then from that point to move into a discussion of um, the birth of the Western Night in Egypt. But first she points out, she starts with the figurine of the great mother, the Venus of Willendorf, and says that now look at this figure. It represents uh, a diminution of the sense of sight and a stepping up of the haptic sense of touch. It's a sculpted figurine that's only four inches large, um, but it has no face. It has braided cornrows for hair and barely any arms at all. The arms are very thin. They're like barely like flapping wings that are barely etched out. Um, she misses that William Marvel Thompson pointed this out, that the breasts, with the, the way the arms are la laced across them, uh, resemble the head of the gland's penis, uh, which would be a representation of an sort of androgyne motif, or at least what she's talking about here is the cosmogonic motif of the originator of creation containing the powers of both sexes, in which uh, the, the semen that comes forth from the man is the milk, uh, is analogous to the milk that comes forth from the breast, and both powers are there are present uh, in the cosmogonic originator. But uh, Polly wants to draw your attention to the fact that this is this sort of saggy, plump, uh, great mother who is all earth and Thonian power, cave, womb, tomb, all of that kind of thing is in there, and no face at all, pendulous breast, fat, plump, not a figure pleasing to the eye especially. So she thinks there's more of a haptic sense in this civilization. The eye has not come along. So she says, well, the eye was discovered by in the West by the Egyptians. They are the first to have a crisp sense for hard, angular edges and lines. She says the, the Nile is the first straight line uh, in civilization. She makes the mistake of saying that the Egyptians invented uh, elaborate architectural construction. They did not. That comes from the Sumerians. The Sumerians were there first. They were building huge, complex temples to goddesses like Inanna in 3500 BC in places like Uruk and Ur, massive temples. They had already discovered right angles and, and lines, and they already had were working on statues. I don't think they're... I agree with her that the Sumerian aesthetics... Uh, is not as good as Egyptian aesthetics. I think Egyptian art is much, they were much better at art than the Mesopotamians were. But nonetheless, they were there on the scene. And as Henri Frankfurt remarks in his book, The Birth of Civilization in the Near East, it's very likely that the very art of architectural construction was imported to Egypt from uh, Uruk. Uh, there's a so-called Arukian phase where Uruk has gone and become a sort of uh, Imperial Cosmopolis setting up trade routes everywhere, all over the Middle East and all over, possibly down through the, Ver the, the Persian Gulf to India and on into Egypt. Uh, early Egyptian architecture, it is significant as mud brick. The Sumerians, the Mesopotamians, always built out of mud brick. That's why most of their monuments are gone and haven't survived. Uh, the native Egyptian building element was, of course, stone. And as they gradually set, shed this, there, there's a kind of pseudomorphosis, to use Spengler's term, of the uh, Sumerian civilization on Egypt, but they shed it pretty quickly. Some of their early temples have buttressing and crenellation on the sides that could only have come from Mesopotamia, but they shed that and get rid of it. And Frankfurt talks about all of this in his wonderful little book. So it's likely that all of this, these kinds of architectural things have come uh, from Sumerian, uh, the Sumerians who were first in almost everything that you can think of. But nonetheless, the Egyptians did discover this idea of the eye gliding along smooth surfaces. They really polish their sculptures to the point that their diorite statues just gleam and the eye just glides over them. And so she wants to point out that this is the birth of the Apollonian eye, the eye of Horus, as it would have been represented in Egyptian art, that this is where the, the sense for Western aesthetics comes from, and that the Greeks got it from the Egyptians, which they very well may have, because there probably was at least a sort of light pseudomorphosis of Egypt on the Greeks, since we know that those Kuros boy statues with the one foot forward um, are striding in a pose that is exactly like a pharaoh uh, represented in the statues with one foot forward, one arm forward. That, that pose, that iconotype invented by the Egyptians clearly was inherited by the Greeks. So there's at least a light pseudomorphosis that the Greeks inherited from the Egyptians and that they had to shrug off, which they did, of course. And so we have the birth of the eye, and she concludes this section by talking about uh, the sculpture of Nefertiti with the big hat, the famous one, one of the most famous portrait busts in the world that comes to us from the court of Ignaton about 1350 BC. Nefertiti was the wife of Ignaton and at one point co-regent, co-ruler with him. Her hat, though, by the way, is not uh, a, a merely stylish, fashionable 
uh, Parisian uh, type sophistication thing going on there. It's actually the, the headgear associated with the goddess Tefnut, whom we mentioned earlier, who was the consort of Shu. And uh, Eknaten is represented in some cases on uh, as at the Gempatun temple, wearing the headgear of the god Shu, so the two form the brother-sister pair, Shu and Tefnut, uh, with the headgear. So um, nonetheless, uh, she says that this statue represents uh, the Western sense of the gaze. It's totally the opposite to the Venus of Willendorf, which is all body, no face. This is pure face, pure gaze. Uh, the missing eye is upsetting and disturbing. It's very rectilinear and sleek, and you can already see uh, what the influence is going to be on the West from this type of artwork. And the goddess's face has been withdrawn or pulled, as it were, from out of the Great Mother, and now it's all about her head. There's been a shift, once again, from belly magic to head magic, or uh, from what I term the maternal vulva, uh, to the paternal vulva uh, in the shift of these cults as they evolve over time. And so uh, that's the gist of this chapter. It was a wonderful chapter on uh, the birth of the Western eye.